Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. I'm glad to see you. I'm Janice Robinson, Vice President for Diversity and Community Affairs. And welcome, and particularly welcome to, our, to those who are live streaming. Um, welcome to Journey to the Doctoral Degree, Avoiding Pitfalls and Achieving Excellence. And I'm just going to say this, we know that there's a 510 class, so don't feel odd about having to get up. Uh, the speaker knows that as well. Um, we're happy that you're here. Um, so all students, and, and particularly our students of color, um, are always seeking advice and tidbits and real guidance concerning graduate education, uh, learning about and negotiating the academic and cultural complexities of doctoral education as well. And as a result, five years ago, uh, my office created with the provost's office the Black and Latinx Male Doctoral Education Initiative. And we continue that, broad, that, that focus broadly and we have expanded to the Diversity in Doctoral Education Initiative. And the, the initiative's aims really are to encourage our diverse pool of master's students to learn about and consider education. Because we know some people come in, they're just thrilled to be here, they're, they're focused on their master's degree, and they don't think about doctoral education. And so we think it's really important to think of our master's students in particular as a cohort, right? So that we can provide the kind of information about uh, the ins and outs of considering doc doctoral education. Additionally, uh, the uh, small group of our faculty asked us to also think about our current doctoral students and to provide the kind of guidance and help uh, so that they can navigate their academic and professional journeys through here. So that looks, that looks like some of the panels that we've had with um, IRB, about fellowships, about um, working with and negotiating your relationships with advisors, and we can continue to do that. Uh, we have had tremendous support from our faculty who continually serve on our panels and provide real talk and real advice and share their own doctoral experiences. One summer we hosted a boot camp for our current, uh, our then current doctoral students and it was organized and led by Dr. Felicia Mensa. Is she here? Is she in the room? Stand, just wave, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and there were many other faculty that were part of that. So we are quite pleased to continue uh, this work with Dr. Uh, Larry Rowley. Uh, his bio is in the program, but for those who are live streaming, I want to share just a brief uh, bio. So, Dr. Larry Lee Rowley um, is co-founder and principal consultant of LBMC Associates, a strategic educational and leadership consulting firm. He previously taught in the Irvin D. Reed Honors College at Wayne State University in Detroit, and was, faculty, was a faculty member in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies and, uh, and the Center for the Study of Higher and Post-Secondary Education at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, he's also, he was also an academic and research program officer at the Rackham Graduate School where he managed several diversity and mentoring initiatives, particularly around uh, recruitment and mentoring and research training of undergraduates and doctoral students, including those from underrepresented groups. He also served for 12 years as a faculty advisor to the Summer Research Opportunity Program and the Rackham Summer Institute for incoming doctoral students uh, where he mentored hundreds of doctoral students and undergraduate students who were interested in pursuing master's and doctoral degrees. He earned his BA from Old Dominion University and his uh, MED and his PhD from the University of Virginia. I just want to touch on, on his research uh, highlights and his research combines historical insights from the black intellectual tradition with analysis of, of contemporary educational practices and policies uh, relative to African American students. His scholarship has explored African American aspirations, access, and attainment in higher education, as well as the role of race in academic and social inequality, and the relationship between universities and black communities, and the impact of race, racial and ethnic diversity on the civic mission uh, of, of American higher education, as well as the challenges confronting undergraduate and graduate students in higher ed. 
Uh, very quickly, he has published his research in numerous scholarly journals. He's received numerous awards, including for his exemplary mentoring of graduate students. And Dr. Rowley is a frequent speaker and consultant on issues of, of race, education, and African American history. So we are thrilled that he is joining us today. And this is really for, I'm happy everyone is here, staff and faculty, but this is really for the students. And so thank you very much, Dr. Rowley. Thank you, Janice. Can you guys hear me okay? Um, be before I get started, um, I, I want to say that I'm really delighted uh, to have the opportunity to speak here at Teachers College. Uh, this, of course, is one of the most um, prestigious and esteemed uh, graduate schools of not only education, but also health and psychology uh, in the country and, and, and by virtue of that in the world. And so it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity um, to come to this institution and to share a little bit about what I think I might know um, about doctoral education. Now, I'm going to give you an overview of what I want to talk about, but um, before I do that, how many of you in the room are um, PhD or doctoral students right now? And how many of you are, are master's students? Okay. Huh. Might, be, might be pretty balanced be, between the two. So I'm going uh, I'm to attempt to offer you some, some insights, some things to think about that might be a little counterintuitive. And if you bear with me, I think by the end of my remarks, some of what I have to say to you might actually make sense. And I noted that when Juan Carlos prepared the flyer for this event, after I had an opportunity to have conversations with him and, um, and Janice, he noted on that flyer that one of the things that I've attempted to do over the course of my career, and, and I'll try to do some of that here, and hopefully it'll be insightful for you in some way or another, and that is to sort of demystify kind of exactly what PhD study is. It's, it's not always what people think it is. And even those of us who are fortunate enough to study in doctoral programs, sometimes we're, we're still sort of figuring it out. There, there's a, a bit of a mystique about doctoral study. And uh, in fact, I, I would also argue that in the wider society, outside of academic context, there, there can also be a bit of a mystique about what the degree signifies. Most people think that a doctoral degree signifies something about our intellect, those of us who uh, go on that journey and complete it, and indeed it does. Um, but it says a lot more. It signals a lot more. And is uh, deeply rooted in some historical and cultural things that I think if going in or during the journey or even after you've completed it, if, if you reflect and kind of think about why such a prestigious degree that is so sort of mystical, and in some cases mystifying, if you can get a little bit about the history and culture and think a little bit about uh, why we think about the PhD or other doctoral degrees in the way that we do, I think that might be helpful. And socialization is a really big part of that, and I'll say something about that in a minute. So I've titled my remarks um, today, uh, Journey to the Doctoral Degree, Avoiding Pitfalls and Achieving Excellence. And there are indeed a lot of pitfalls that uh, one can encounter uh, on the way to doctoral study, during doctoral study, and probably most problematic of all is we have this notion of what we call ABD, all but dissertation. And our, and our our nation is littered with, I'm not even sure exactly what the numbers are, but far too many people who have gotten all the way through their coursework, oftentimes through their qualifying or preliminary exams, and for one reason or another didn't complete um, the degree. And in fact, 
somewhere between 40 and 50 percent. And it's really difficult um, to get the number nailed down completely, but somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of individuals who start doctoral programs don't finish them. And so it's, it's a really hard nut to crack. And that's, that's, not, that's not a good number. Because when people embark on something like doctoral study, they have really high expectations, aspirations, and anticipation. And to see folks start out with such promise and for a variety of reasons not finish, that's very troubling. And when, I'll tell you a little bit about my own story in a moment. But let me, let me show you. Th this is my overview for what I want to talk to you about. I want to give you a little bit, not a lot, about my background. And I'll say a little bit about some of the work that, uh, that I've done, um, much of it in conjunction with my better half, uh, your provost and dean, um, to advance doctoral education and to support and encourage and mentor doctoral students um, to develop and work on mentoring initiatives and the like. So I'll say a little bit about that. Then I'm going to take a bit of a counterintuitive uh, uh, tack, and I'm going to say something about the historical and cultural um, uh, um, underpinnings of doctoral study. And I think it's really important, and again, I want you to be patient and bear with me as I, as I try to explain to you why I think that the medieval origins and the apprenticeship model uh, that doctoral study is based on is so crucially important. Oftentimes, we are pretty clueless about how an apprenticeship model came to be in the academy, how it works in context, how it works in the larger disciplinary areas in which we're studying, and then ultimately for those of us who go on to be uh, professors and mentors of graduate students of our own, if we, if we don't have a firm grip on that, I, I really think we're missing something. Now I'm not going to try to give you a comprehensive history of the medieval origins of doctoral study, but I'm going to say a few things about it. Um, and then. Embedded in this are what I'm calling the secrets of the craft. And um, I wear a lot of different hats. And one of the hats that I wear, uh, which I won't go into in any detail at all, it, just to say that I'm also uh, a member of some fraternal and mutual aid uh, associations, in, including uh, being a Freemason. And one of the things about these mystical kinds of organizations that have this kind of hierarchical and tiered type of structure to make and advance through it is that the secrets really aren't secrets. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in a little bit. Um, I'll share just a few quick uh, data snippets, and then I'll get directly to what I, uh, what I think is most important, which is some of those pitfalls and problems to avoid and some, excellence, uh, uh, some excellent habits to acquire. And then I'll, uh, I'll just give you my concluding thoughts. Um, so let's take a look at this image. Now, th this is from a 14th century um, French manuscript, the Chance Royal uh, manuscript. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing that. Uh, I took Spanish all through high school and several semesters in college. My wife is the French speaker in our home. Um, but this is from a 14th century manuscript, and this is entitled Meeting of Doctors at the University of Paris. Now, if, if you look at that, it looks very hierarchical. It looks very austere. Um, everybody is white. Everybody is male. And uh, it, the imagery is very angular, is it not? And then, let me back up. We see this individual with a mace, this individual with a mace, this individual with a mace. And this person is literally sitting on a throne and seems to be in charge of things. Now, the only thing that I can think of um, that might resonate in terms of being more austere and more hierarchical, uh, more uh, white and more male uh, and more Eurocentric than this image is maybe uh, a conclave of the Cardinal uh, College of Cardinals when they're selecting a new pope. Yes? 
You follow me? So, so this, this is the, the sort of medieval origins of uh, what doctoral study and the university academy looked like, right? So I just, I, I just thought that image would kind of capture uh, just how homogeneous the doctorate and the professoriate uh, was in, uh, in medieval times. But I also said to you that doctoral study is modeled on uh, apprenticeship guilds. And I don't know if you can, if you can see this, but uh, the craft guilds in the Middle Ages in Europe, let me back up. They formed an important part, important part of town life during the medieval period. They trained young people in a skilled job. That means they were able to do something after their training, and that training was going to lead to something that was needed, which was a job, yes? So that's pretty straightforward. Trained young people in a skilled job, regulated the quality of goods sold, so there's some quality control built in there, and were major forces in community life. And this simply means that members of the guilds, they had security, they had skills, and they had influence, right? We would like to think that all doctoral holders in, uh, in the United States would also have that type of security, uh, but we know that's not so. Uh, we'll say a little bit more about that later. So, um, guild services. Set working conditions, covered members with a type of health insurance. There's more security there. Provided funeral expenses, dowries for poor girls, etc. Uh, also benefits uh, to the community. Uh, built almshouses for victims of misfortune. Guaranteed quality work. Took turns policing the streets and donated windows to the church. So you can see that there is this interplay between the guilds and the communities in which they were embedded. So the guilds were elite and prestigious, but they gave back something really, really important to the communities in which they were a part. And then there's this tripartite nature of the skilled craft guilds, right? The apprentice. The apprentice was a young man whose parents paid for him to get training in, in some craft. Uh, that individual lived with the master and his family. You can see how tightly coiled the apprentice was with the individual that was teaching and, uh, and developing and training him, right? Required to obey the master. That's how serious that relationship was. They trained anywhere from two to seven years. Couldn't even get married during that period. They had to be absolutely focused on what they were doing. Uh, and then when they, uh, when they finished their training, they moved to this next step, which is journeyman. And this is an individual who was a day worker. This person worked for their master and earned, uh, earned a salary while they were doing it. Six days out of the week they had to do it. Needed ultimately to produce a masterpiece. That means his finest work in whatever the particular craft it was this, this, this individual worked in. So if he was a cabinet maker, he was going to have to make a master cabinet that really showed that he uh, uh, had mastered the, uh, the skills of the trade and had to be accepted uh, ultimately by the guild to become a master. So you did this masterpiece, but then you also had to be signed off on in order to move to the next level. That kind of sounds a little bit like passing qualifying exams, prelims, that sort of thing. And then master. This person owned his own shop, worked with other masters, and this is really important, to protect their trade, right? In order for the trade to continue to be beneficial to the guild members and the community, they had to have high quality control and not just anybody could waltz in, right? You couldn't just walk in off the street and say, I'm going to be a master in this, in this guild. Uh, and sometimes they served in civic government. This is a level of esteem they had, okay? Now, what does that have to do with graduate study? You'll see some parallels here, right? Look at that. A new apprentice goes and lives with and works with the master craftsman. A beginning doctoral student comes in and initially is assigned an advisor and works with a university faculty uh, member. A journeyman or fellow craft uh, has to produce that masterpiece to move on to the next level. 
a doctoral candidate in order to become ABD or to become a candidate, that person uh, has to pass those qualifying exams and then ultimately has to write a dissertation. So if you don't produce that masterpiece and get voted on as a journeyman, you won't become a master. If you don't pass those qualifying exams, write that dissertation and have that committee sign off, you're never going to become Dr. So-and-so. And ultimately, once you become a master, you up uphold the uh, standards and, uh, of the craft and train new craftsmen. And then, of course, doctors, those who choose to go into academia, the professoriate, they uphold disciplinary standards and train new scholars. So in a nutshell, you can at least see that as ancient as those craft guilds were, all the way back in medieval times, we still have, we still have some parallels here. I don't think I'm stretching to say that we do. Now, in academic context, I mentioned the secrets of the craft, and I paired this notion of secrets with socialization. Right? There are certain things, uh, when I submitted a petition to uh, a Masonic Lodge in Charlottesville, actually when I was working on my PhD, um, there, there were things that I wasn't going to know. And, you know, this was right when the age of the Internet was just really starting to take off. Um, so now you would say, well, there can't be any secrets in, in anything because everything's on the Internet including Masonic rituals, all the guidelines for this, that, or the other thing. You can find everything on the Internet, right? So there are no secrets. Well, the secrets aren't secret in the sense that we think. There's a socialization process that has to happen. So an individual who um, reads about doctoral study can read all the books in the world, but if they hadn't had to negotiate coursework, be in a laboratory, interact with cranky professors, try to figure out what, you know, do your peers know more than you or not, then they don't really know. And so socialization is really central to knowing and learning what the secrets are. Let that sink in. Socialization. There was a period of time when we used the words education and socialization as essentially synonyms, right? When you get socialized as a child uh, to live in a household, you know nothing. Everything we, we knew when we were growing up as toddlers and so forth, it was because within the context of our families and our communities, we were socialized. We learned by living and by doing. Would anybody disagree? We learned by living and by doing. That's also important to acquiring the secrets of the guild or of the academy or of your uh, doctoral program. And this is a quote from uh, one of my favorite books, uh, Berger and Luckman's 1966 treatise, The Social Construction of Reality. And essentially, that book is about the sociology of knowledge. They're trying to show us how what we come to know in any social context or setting, what we come to know and believe as real and true it happens through a social process. And so this quote, I think, is very important. Socialization, the training to be a part of a community of any sort, always takes place in the context of a specific social structure. All right? Let's go back here for a minute. We see structure there. People know where they're supposed to sit. They know what they're supposed to be holding. They know who's in charge, right? This is very structured. There's a social structure that underpins all socialization. So in order to be socialized uh, as a graduate student, it's going to happen in a larger social structure and social context. And you have to know almost as much about the structure and the context as you do the academic field you're studying. And this is something that kind of goes over the heads of some new uh, graduate students. They think, my test scores were great. My GPA was great. I went to a prestigious school. All I have to do is take my classes, and I am going to be a success. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Socialization takes place in the context of a very specific social structure. And in fact, let's take the discipline 
since we're talking about social construction of reality. Sociology at Columbia University is going to have a lot in common with sociology at, say, University of Michigan, right? Discipline is going to have some things in common. That's the nature of it. But things are going to be different within the local context. So you've got to understand context and social structure. Now, this is uh, a quote from Socialization of Graduate and Professional Students in Higher Ed. Um, Weidman is uh, probably the premier uh, higher ed scholar that has written uh, the most well-regarded um, work on socialization in higher ed for both undergraduates and graduate students. And this is what they say in this uh, ASH monograph. Graduate students experience socialization processes that reflect all three of these are important. The chosen discipline, the structure and sequence of their academic program and their university setting. Now, what is this telling you? This is telling you that time and space and sequencing are important. I've had graduate students come in their first semester of doctoral study and tell me what their dissertation is going to be on. That doesn't, that doesn't usually work. That's not the sequencing, right? Or they'll say, I'm a qualitative researcher. They've not taken a single research course and they've decided they're a qualitative researcher. So the socialization process is there are going to be some norms from the discipline, the structure and sequencing of your program, which can vary across different contexts and different fields, and your university setting, right? So, Teachers College, an affiliate of Columbia University, is going to be very different doing graduate study here than, say, the Curry School of Education at the University of Virginia. Because the setting, the context, the relationship between the larger university and the school or college of education is different, right? Okay. Now, in order to... Um, tweak their original model, Weidman and his colleagues over the last decade or so got, let's call it some constructive criticism about the generic socialization model for graduate study that uh, by some people's lights didn't take into consideration enough of the diversity of identities of graduate students, right? And this is a particular challenge in the age in which we're beginning to really see diversity as a strength, and we're wanting to do things that are going to help diversify uh, the uh, pool of doctoral recipients, the professoriate, uh, and leaders in a range of, of different contexts in our society. Right? So they've, they've begun to add consideration of gender diversity, race and ethnicity, culture and language, religion. Uh, issues that international students face. Now, of course, socioeconomic status can cut across all of those things, differences there. And at the, at the core of it, in order for individuals to uh, be included and fully integrated into their academic settings, the social context or the social structure where they're studying, there are lots of things that go into it. Uh, first, you've got to be admitted. And it's great to have financial support. Uh, by the way, a very disturbing trend that I've uh, observed is that now more and more uh, African Americans pursuing uh, PhDs or doctorates are paying out of pocket and incurring a, extraordinary amounts of, of debt. That, that's a real problem. So while historically we have kind of tried to take into consideration the, uh, the financial situation of full-time doctoral students, that is something that really, really uh, has, to be, uh, has to be monitored and dealt with. And then this last part here, mentoring and the peer faculty climate. And those last items right there are really, really central to, to everything. And I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, before I address that socialization model, I want to tell you a little bit about why I became so 
um, interested in trying to um, help encourage, support, mentor doctoral students, help demystify some of the challenges and to be an advocate for individuals from all backgrounds who, who want to pursue doctoral study. Uh, I grew up in rural Virginia, although I was born here in New York City, I was raised in rural Virginia. I lost both of my parents when I was a young boy. And I had uh, a really challenging childhood, but I had some extraordinary teachers, and I had great coaches, and I had community members, church members, adults in my community who, who saw a lot of potential in me and really supported and encouraged me. So it was, it was a really big deal for me to be the first person in my family to go to college and complete it. And then at some point after working in college admissions at my alma mater, I decided I wanted to get a master's degree and continue a career in higher ed. And that's when I went off to the University of Virginia and I met uh, another graduate student who was studying developmental psychology. And somehow along the way, uh, we fell in love. And even though I had this great plan for what I was going to do after I completed my master's degree, um, your provost convinced me that I might actually be PhD material. Uh, and, um, and I decided to stick around. Um, and so I stuck around. Uh, we got married, and we were graduate students uh, pursuing doctoral education together. And I had some real challenges. I was the only full-time African-American student in my entire PhD program. There was one other African-American student. She was a part-time student. And I was extremely isolated. And it was tough. Not only was I isolated, but I didn't have a great mentor. I had an advisor who, for the first uh, year or so, he and I bumped heads all the time. Um, he was a middle-aged white guy, well-intentioned, but I think he was a little disgruntled because he never made full professor. And uh, he and I just, at first, we didn't really get along at all. And there came a time when I was ready to quit and the only thing that ultimately stopped me from quitting, besides the fact that uh, my wife was kind of looking at me out of the <laughs> corner of her eye, um, was that I had some faculty members who were not even in my program, but were in the School of Education, who convinced me that I actually deserved that degree. And for somebody to look at me and tell me that with my background and the challenges I was facing, that I deserved that degree, it totally altered my perspective. And I was eternally grateful uh, for them believing in me enough to tell me that. And so I made it part of my mission to do as much of that as I could for, for other graduate students. Let me, let me just read to you a little bit from the 2018 Survey of Earned Doctorates. And it's a section in the front of the report asking why is this important, meaning why is doctoral education important? And they say the American system of doctoral education is widely considered to be among the world's best, as evidenced by the large number of international students, many of them among the top students in their countries, who choose to pursue doctoral degrees at U.S. universities. Doctorate recipients begin careers in large and small organizations, teach in universities, and start new businesses. Doctoral education develops human resources that are critical to a nation's progress. Scientists, engineers, researchers, and scholars who create and share new knowledge and new ways of thinking that lead directly and indirectly to innovative products, services, and works of art. In doing so, they contribute to a nation's economic growth, cultural development, and rising standard of living. And if you think about it, that's very similar at least in terms of the ideal, to that relationship that those uh, guilds and craftsmen have with their communities. By virtue of them going through that training and being able to offer what they're very skilled at to the communities and societies of which they're a part, it was beneficial to everyone. And so doctoral education and the diversity of individuals who acquire doctoral degrees and then make those kinds of contributions is really important. And 
it troubles me when so many individuals, almost um, half of those who start, give up. So when I was writing my dissertation, I had a reminder from Benjamin Mays' autobiography about why I should persist. And I want to just read you a little quote here. Regardless of one's previous academic record, he takes a risk when he announces his intention to earn a PhD, especially at an institution like the University of Chicago, where Mays got his doctorate. It was a prevailing opinion that the university made it difficult for those who sought the degree, and it was rumored that approximately half, there's that half again, of those who started out in the department in which I was enrolled failed to accomplish their goal. He said, I knew a few persons who had failed their PhD work at the University of Chicago, and it seemed to me that they were never quite the same thereafter. A man who seeks a doctorate and fails to earn it seems to go through life either apologizing for his shortcoming or overcompensating for the failure. Now, I know there are some individuals that begin doctoral study and don't finish it who don't quite feel that desperate, but also know that there are a lot who do. And for somebody to be that bright and to invest that much and to have um, one out of every two walk away and leave, that's just not acceptable. So this is, uh, this is the Weidman socialization model. And you'll see that right in the center of the model, what goes on in that institutional context, there are basically two main dimensions. The institutional culture, which for the purposes of this model includes the academic fields or disciplines, the peer climate or the relationship with your peers, other students, and then the faculty climate, your relationship with the faculty and also the relationship that faculty have with each other. And that can be a real minefield, particularly when you get to uh, trying to choose a dissertation committee. And oftentimes, students have no idea what they're getting into when they're trying to put some people together that really shouldn't be in the same room. Um, and then there's the socialization processes there, right? Interaction, integration, and learning. And the desired outcomes, of course, are over here. The knowledge, skills, and dispositions. And then the commitment to the field and the owning of the identity of the scholar in that field. But there's more to it. And we see that life goes on, even though you're part of this larger disciplinary or professional community. What about this? How many of you have family members who know you're working on a doctorate, but they have no idea what you're doing? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise them up high. Look at that. Look, look around. That happens often in communities of color, but also for first generation uh, graduate students, right? And you know they're proud of you, right? Yeah? But, but they don't understand what you're doing. They don't know what a committee is. They're, they're like, you're, you're, you're presenting your paper? What, what? Yeah. So there are lots of other factors that come into play, right? But at the core is this, and communities of color and first generation um, students oftentimes culturally have very different commitments in this arena. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, in a little bit time to degree and you're going to, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'll come back. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, look at this. These are the data for um, basically the last 60 years about um, doctorates awarded in the United States from 1958 to 2018. And so the, the green that you see there, that's science and engineering fields. And you can see that there was a sharp incline here. It leveled off in the 70s, the mid 80s. It started going up again. It leveled off a little bit. And then it took off in the 21st century and continues to climb. Right? And we, and we see a roughly similar kind of trend for those fields that are not STEM fields. Right? But uh, roughly 50,000 
doctoral degrees were awarded in 2018. And oftentimes we don't know how many individuals drop out of doctoral study because generally there's not really good exit interviews. And there's really only been one uh, really, really robust study of dropouts. And this, is, uh, this book is almost 20 years old now. This is Barbara Lovett's book, Leaving the Ivory Tower. And, and she was really committed to getting uh, dropouts to, to talk about they, what they went through, primarily because of her own personal story. She dropped out of two PhD programs <laughs> and was a, um, a researcher for the federal government in DC and really was so frustrated with what happened to her twice that she decided to do the research. And she got funding for it and her mentors in the uh, ed research community for the, uh, for the feds said, you know, you should really, if you're gonna do all that research and you got the huge grant to do this work, you should really go back and get a PhD. <laughs> and, and she figured out that she was going to do it in sociology. And so she wrote the book. Um, and I'll, I'll share with you some of, some of what she uh, noted in a minute. Now, these are doctoral uh, recipients um, from underrepresented groups. And um, my dear wife said, you need to practice and make sure you know what you're, what you're going to say about th those data slides. And I'm like, okay, all right, all right. So here's what I'm going to say, dear. I'm just going to go to this last column, the most recent data, and say that there were 55,000 uh, doctoral uh, recipients altogether. Uh, and of those, these are the numbers for non-Hispanics, uh, uh, American Indians and Alaska Natives, only 116. That's down from 141 back here in 2015. Asian, 14,815. That's increased, not a lot, but steadily over that uh, five-year period. African Americans, 3,000 in 2018. Now that's an increase, but not a lot. And then, of course, 28,000 plus of those were, uh, were white. So there's, there's a lot of work that we can do in terms of trying to increase the diversity of the doctoral recipient um, pool. Would you agree? OK. All right. And then here, I'm only going to say anything, again, following the lead of, of uh, my better half. I'm just going to go right here. Since we're in a school of education and psychology, uh, we're going to go here. And, and what we see here, this is where more African Americans get doctorates than in any other category, all right? About 14, 15% of the doctorates in 2018 for blacks was in education. In uh, psychology and social sciences, you can see that uh, the multiracial group, about 4%. For Hispanic Latinos, about 8%. A little bit less than that for African Americans, Asians. Now, look at the, these numbers, though, uh, for Asians. Most of them are engineering, math, physical sciences, life sciences. So the quote unquote hard sciences, STEM fields, um, Asians are blowing everybody else out of the water there. Now, this I think is very telling. It's a very simple graph, uh, uh, figure to look at, but let's take a look and see. That top line, that's the education line from 99 to 2018. First, this, this is median time to degree. So it's good that Median time to degree is going down. Well, what is that? Uh, it's roughly 12 years, 11 or 12 years. That's the median. So half of the folks got their degree in less time than that, and half above that. 
And we don't know what the upper limit is, right? Because it's a median. It's not an average. It's a median. At the very bottom there, physical sciences and earth sciences. But you can see all these other fields, math and computer science, they're clustered together. What we have here in the middle are the humanities and arts and uh, other non-science and engineering fields. It used to be we thought that the longest time to degree, we thought that was the humanities because folks are going off and doing uh, philosophical treatises and doing field work and you know anthropology field work in some remote uh, developing country and they'd be out there for God knows how long. But that's not what the trend shows us. So why do you all think, this is not a rhetorical question, education takes so long? Uh, absolutely, a lot, a lot of people are full time. Um, and, and one, probably another difference is also that, uh, that's a good point. Uh, good point. She said not enough funding yet. Okay. What? Okay, good. Good, what else? Anybody have any other ideas about what it is? Well, I know that I, I know there's really sharp economists um, who can probably figure that out for us. Isn't that right, President Bailey? Why, why, why is that, Tom? What's, ta what's taking so long? Do we know? All these, all of these reasons. <laughs> well, that's that's a that's a wise president, isn't it? Um, so. That, that's, that's a real issue. I mean, when you have half of the people taking more than 12 years, uh, as recently as two years ago, um, that's, that's, that's not good. All right. Now, some of the factors, according to Barbara Lovitz in that study that I mentioned, um, that really have a major impact on doctoral dropout. And as you go through these, I want you to reflect back on this guild-like structure and what I told you about socialization. Look at this. So lack of information. If you're not being socialized, if you're not being mentored, if you're not in social networks, and you're not fully integrated into your context, you're not going to have all the information that you need, right? One of my favorite books I recommend it to all of you is Being Bright is Not Enough. The Unwritten Rules of Doctoral Study by Peggy Hawley. Uh, God rest her soul, she passed a few years ago. But that book is in its, uh, in, its, in its third edition. I think the most recent edition was 2010. You know, I would encourage you to read the scholarship, the research, but that is a really well-informed self-help book that has some real practical ideas uh, for what you need to know, particularly those things that are not written down, some of those things you need to know. So lack of information is one. Absence of community. That's what happened to me. Nobody called me a racial slur. Nobody spit in my face. I just, I just wasn't connected. People weren't inviting me out for drinks on Friday night. I was just isolated. An absence of community can be a real, real problem uh, in doctoral study. You need to be connected. And there's a significant amount of, of, of research that talks about ways to do that. Um, and community in the sense that um, not just academic community, but also uh, social community. Um, disappointment with the learning experience. Now, sometimes people just realize that what they thought they wanted to do or what they thought they were going to learn in a particular field is, is just not working for them anymore. So sometimes if you're disappointed with the way things are structured or the way things play out in a particular uh, academic setting, sometimes people just, they don't want to do it anymore, all right? They become disillusioned. Uh, that's, not, that's not always a bad thing, but that is one of the factors that came up in her research. And then this last one. This is the major one. Go back to the guild idea, the apprenticeship. 
I almost quit my doctoral program for two reasons. Absence of community, and I was really not pleased with the relationship I had with my advisor. Once I found a substitute for community or some supplements, things got better. And once my advisor and I kind of had the come to Jesus talk, where I yelled at him and he yelled at me, <laughs> that got better. It got a lot better. Now, when Stephanie got a job and we moved to North Carolina from Charlottesville, every time I would have to go back to meet with my advisor, I would get frustrated because we had to have two meetings every time. I had to remind him everything we talked about in the previous meeting and then have the meeting that we had scheduled. So that, that was a problem, but, but we ultimately got through it. Factors that in, uh, influence completion. And this is, um, these are some of the things that Holly puts in her book, and I pulled those out because you see they map onto that socialization and that kind of uh, uh, community uh, dynamic that was alluded to before. So obviously, um, selecting the right program is important. Mentoring is huge, all right? Now, it can get tricky, but you can have an advisor, a mentor, and a dissertation chair, and they're not necessarily the same person. It's great if it is the same person. But oftentimes in doctoral study, you get assigned an advisor, maybe loosely based on what was in your application, whether or not they're taking students. There are a lot of complex dynamics. That's how I ended up with my advisor. And the community that I was in was so small, when I wanted to switch, the guy I wanted to switch to, he was like, man, this is a small community. I can't pill for his student. He said, just keep me on as a co-mentor. So I still got mentoring from him, got advice and advising from my advisor. He became my dissertation chair, and that other mentor served on my committee, and it all worked out. But that mentoring component is important. And sometimes you have to get mentoring not only within your program, but sometimes you might have to go outside it. Because mentoring doesn't just include the academic stuff. It also includes, you know, sometimes you need to be able to talk about what's going on in your life. Sometimes you might have an issue that you don't want to be aired out in your, uh, in your department. And so those are some things that are really important. Obviously, we know financial support is important. The environment, there's that environment, that social structure and context again. That's important. Uh, research mode of the field. If you don't master the uh, norms of scholarship in your field, you're never going to write a dissertation that's going to pass muster. So that almost goes without saying. And then this is basically information again. I bet you many of you, if you've been here more than a semester, have learned that staff and peers are really good places to go for information, right? Sometimes going to a website just won't do it for you, right? And you have some really, really great staff here at Teachers College. From the president all the way down, there are some really wonderful people here, and you're very fortunate in that respect. Now, I mentioned you want to avoid pitfalls. These are the kinds of things that maybe some folks won't say, but I'm going to say because I'm trying to give you the truth. If you fall prey to imposter syndrome, that can be paralyzing. And most of us have experienced it at one time or another. Even the most competent scholar, right? I have, I have a friend who is um, about to be appointed an endowed professor. And this guy is still worried sometimes about whether or not he's measuring up to some of his peers. And so imposter syndrome, we all, we all experience it sometimes. And sometimes just being able to talk it out with someone who's not going to endorse the fact that <laughs> or tell you that you actually are an imposter is a real good thing. <laughs> um, if you become socially isolated, sometimes the context leads to that, but sometimes if you're a shrinking violet, like every now and again, go to that cocktail party even if you are shy. You know, um, 
don't, don't always be a wallflower. Sometimes you have to push yourself a little bit um, to be able to acquire the community and the connections you want. And for some people, I know personality types and all of that come into play. Um, but it's a guild. And being socially isolated is a killer. And this next one, without information, you could easily violate some of the social and cultural norms of your program. One of the best ways to avoid that that I can think of is talking to um, uh, students that are maybe a little bit ahead of you, all right? Sometimes faculty just want you to figure it out, but your peers will tell you, oh, don't do that. Or, or don't, don't mention that theory in that class, boy, <laughs> right? You know, and being underprepared for your task. Your professors in particular, um, and if you're a research assistant or a teaching assistant, they really, they really rely on you to be prepared. And the more prepared you are, the more um, competencies you'll build up. And the more, it's kind of like if, if, if you handle a few things well, you'll be given more opportunities, more responsibilities. It's kind of like we had to do with our son when he was in middle school. That's how he got, that's how he got a dog. <laughs> Whoops. Um, time management is really, really important. That should go without saying, but I, I, I'll say it anyway. Um, now this right here, boy, don't underestimate the fact that contingencies can come up. Like you might have to move from Charlottesville to Durham, and then you have to figure out how you're going to get the last six credit hours that you need to finish your coursework. Right, dear? All right, now we'll, 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 we'll wrap up on a, on a more positive note here. Um, some habits that you'll want to maximize. You want to build up those social networks, including advanced peers, faculty in the department, and then faculty and peers in the discipline. And so that can be folks that you meet at conferences, folks who come to give talks from other institutions that are maybe doing work that you're interested in. Uh, maybe there's somebody, if you're on the back nine of your program and you're wanting to do a postdoc, wouldn't it be really nice to connect with that person so that they know who you are before you find out if they have any opportunities like that? These, these, are, these are pretty much common sense. Um, this right here, it cannot be underestimated. If you're not doing research and writing, and this, I'm sure it doesn't happen here at Teachers College, but some schools of education, if there's no real research opportunity or opportunity to write the kind of work that's gonna be seriously vetted, then when students get through their qualifying exams, they can really struggle to be able to produce a, a dissertation. I've seen so many students um, just taking a, a litany of research courses does not a researcher make. You learn by doing. And so if it's not built in, don't just say, oh, well, my program, I wasn't assigned a research assistantship, so I don't have to worry about it until my dissertation. No, don't do that. Seek out those opportunities. Get on a research project. Talk to people if you haven't been assigned a, a research assistantship. Go to brown bags. Participate in writing groups. Dissertation writing groups, now, I don't have any empirical data on it, but anecdotally, I've seen tremendous success come out of those. Students getting together a regular time to write. And, and then, of course, within your discipline, attend conferences, symposia, um, write for journals, volunteer to serve on uh, a, a journal as a reviewer. The, these are all things that somebody should be telling you but if they're not, you can't say any more that you weren't told, because I just told you. <laughs> All right, and I'm going to conclude here, and hopefully we'll, we can have some more conversation. We've made progress in doctoral education, but there's a lot more work to be done, particularly in terms of diversifying and cutting into that exorbitant attrition rate that we have. The journey to a doctoral degree is 
infinitely challenging, but it is absolutely worthwhile. I would not give up, well, to save the life of my wife or son, I, I, I would give up my doctoral degree, but short of that, I have no regrets. Uh, with preparation, support, and agency, every single one of you can do it. Thank you. Hello. So you don't have to run away. We're opening up to questions for Dr. Rowley. But I just want to emphasize that the mics are here so that can, you can use it. We're committed to a fully accessible experience. So please come over to the mic. Use your mic, the mic microphone for questions. No teacher voices. Just use the microphones, please. Thank Hi. you. Hi, thank you, Dr. Hi. Raleigh. Tell can me your name. Me? My name is Yvonne Teveno. I'm in the PhD in science ed program. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for the information. I have a, just a question. One is the hierarchical structure that you shared is maybe just one structure of many. So in Africa, there might be the GRIO and there might be Absolutely. other yep. Yep. kind of informal spaces. Sure. And in other cultures, there's yep. other spaces Absolutely. where yep. there's that hierarchy. Yep. So the question I have is, I guess the big idea gleaned from here would be to a doctoral student or one whose perspective that there's an environment that we would have to get to know and there's different things, standards, et cetera, that yep. we must do in order to succeed or at least yeah. it's suggested. Yeah. But the question I have is today in 2020, how might a student or how might a, f a department become more responsive to the varied needs of students so that students can succeed, but also the department that might be that traditional hierarchical structure mm -hmm. can also meld mm -hmm. with the different machinations okay. so that all can survive. Right, right. I get it. Um, excellent, excellent question. Um, a couple of things um, come to mind. So culture, changes very, very slowly. Uh, most of us know, um, you know, that, you know, a culture that was built from so far back and that's been ingrained for a long time can be, uh, can be really um, difficult to change. But there are a couple of things um, that I would recommend. One is that um, you do absolutely have rights as students uh, to advocate for some of the kinds of supports and some of the kinds of things that would make your uh, academic home more like home, right? And so that means um, sometimes you organize and lobby uh, your faculty first. Maybe you start with your advisor. Uh, maybe you uh, go to lunch and have conversations with your department chair. Um, the other uh, really important thing is in hierarchical kinds of settings, oftentimes the word has to come from on high in order to get any traction. And so one of the things that, um, that Stephanie and I were a part of at the University of Michigan is um, particularly around mentoring. Um, at some point, there was an initiative that um, it wasn't mandated, but it was um, there were some incentives to get programs to, to pay more attention to diversity and inclusion. And um, there were incentives like being able to apply for a small grant so leaders can put things in place in that way. Um, when it came to mentoring, we had um, a faculty-wide uh, committee called uh, the MORE Committee. MORE was an acronym for Mentoring Others Results in Excellence. And so there were incentives for faculty who were already doing things in terms of mentoring and diversity to be rewarded so that the reward structure, which for the most part in research university context is largely driven by research, but if there are some incentives for faculty who are already doing some of these things to be supportive. So we had something called faculty allies, and they were able to get small grants to support diversity. We had mentoring others results in excellence where these excellent faculty members who were really uh, good at mentoring became 
quote unquote coaches for other faculty members and there was some financial incentive for them to do that. And it was, it was presented uh, not in a way that was, um, um, that was confrontational, but it was, it was built into the larger culture. Most of us know that um, almost any university now is going to say that they value student development and they value diversity. And so you can leverage what the official mission of these places are. It was like, you say you're about this, but I don't see the evidence of it. And so I wouldn't put all the pressure on students, but, but students can have some impact. But I would really lobby the, the leaders, the people who can actually get the levers of change moving. That's a really, really, really important question. And uh, it, it, it can take time, but it, it can happen. Thanks for the question. Um, so Yvonne asked the question that I was going to ask, which was really about how can we or how have you seen this content brought to the attention of faculty members and um, perhaps work that they've engaged in to restructure kind of uh, the socialization process or other things that doctoral students go through. Um, since you've kind of addressed it, maybe yeah. you can talk a little bit more about if you could reimagine socialization for uh -huh. um, just a doctoral experience, particularly for people of color, what might that look like? Yeah, well, uh, let's, let's, let's go back and connect your two questions. That, that, that rigid hierarchy is, um, in, in, a, in another context, I actually put in, in writing that the ancient craft guild model is outdated, <laughs> right? Uh, I, I know, it's, you know it's been passed on from generation to generation, um, but when you have a much more diverse pool, and, I, and I, th I think you were alluding to it, there are other cultures that are much more communal in nature, right? And so the, the sort of top-down hierarchy doesn't necessarily uh, work for everybody. So part of it could be that one size doesn't fit all. And you know, when you raise the question about how do you get faculty members to understand some of this, that's, that's, that's tough. Uh, and again, it really takes incentives, uh, carrots and sticks, really. Um, but usually, you know, in an academic community, we, we, we prefer to use carrots rather than sticks. Um, so the, the way that I have seen some of this happen, and it comes back to what I said before, is about being able to present some of these things as strengths, right? You're not lowering standards if you don't have this rigid hierarchy. It's okay if, uh, if students um, want to, to work in groups rather than in silos. How do you get faculty on board with these things? It's, it's, it's sort of like, I wrote my dissertation on the public service mission of urban universities. And so I've been sort of wrestling with these uh, areas that we say we value, but they're much lower in terms of the prestige hierarchy and in terms of the reward systems, right? So you're not going to get tenure at Teachers College or Columbia um, just because you're doing work in the community. It's just not going to happen. Um, but if we redesign and tweak some of the incentives and, and bits of the reward structure to make it a little more even and not, uh, and not so rigid in the traditional ways, we, we, we can get some leverage. Um, Again, I, I have to say this, on that, on that same note, you know, there's strength in numbers. So, uh, you know, when you have uh, concerns, I mean, I've heard a little bit about at least one sort of student-led uh, protest around here that's gotten a, a little bit of traction. Um, so I'm not saying everybody needs to lead the revolution, but I am saying that when you're a student and you're part of a community, you can ask for some of the things that you want. Um, and I'm glad um, to talk to folks outside of this context about some of the ways in which I've seen some of, some of these changes at, at least begin to, to get a little bit of traction. I hope, I hope that helps. Hi, my name is Gao Song. I'm a second year master's student. I'm studying arts administration. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your presentation. I think it was really insightful. Uh, However, the one premise that I think their presentation is based off of is that like we will make the correct choice 
when deciding which PhD program to go into. And so as some of us may be transitioning and start looking into programs, like do you have any tips or tricks as to how we can cut through some of the jargon or some of the information, misinformation that is out there about these programs? Like a program may talk about diversity and valuing that, but once you get in, you're, you're in it, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm like the only person right. of color here. Right. Right? right, like, so how do we kind of, right. is there like, yeah, are there things we look for? No, that's, that's, that's a great question, and sometimes you have to act, actually, um, you have to do some reconnaissance, and that means, um, and it's, you know, at, at some level, you almost have to, to treat it like when, uh, when, when you're being a consumer of any other product, right, you know, obviously, um, what's that thing that, as I'm, you know, into my 50s now, I'm starting to forget things. And so I see these commercials for this thing called, what is it, Prevagen, right? Which is supposed to uh, help your memory, right? If only that was true, right? right? I would love to be able to take a supplement that would help my memory. Um, I don't have time to read all the research on, on these supplements. Um, so I'm going to have to figure out a way to acquire some of the information so I can make an informed decision. So that means I have to do some due diligence, right? There's the official narrative, right, which is that this supplement is going to help my memory, right? Do I know anybody who's taking this supplement? Does it help your memory? I'm taking a supplement for my joints that really helps my knee, and I gave the, uh, uh, the dean of the school of professional studies a recommendation. I said, try this. He tried it and it worked. Now, now, I'm being humorous, but there are a couple of things. So visit the places, right? The internet is great, particularly for places that you can't travel to. But if you can visit a place, sit in a class, go out to lunch with students that are already in those programs. Um, when there are visitation weekends um, that are structured, where you can have uh, some time to actually be immersed in the community, you can do some of those things. There, you know, there, there's, there's some ways that you can get more information than the official PR narrative that is uh, as presented. Um, and then um, the last thing, though, that I, I would say is, you know, you really have to, I would almost create a spreadsheet, a grid, of what it is that you really want out of your program. Obviously, you want an excellent program where you, you're going to get good training. But what are the other things that aren't going to necessarily show up uh, on a website or uh, that you're not necessarily going to be able to, to, to easily get at unless you've spent some time thinking about it? And then um, do some of the research in that way. And it's not, it's not always right going to be easy. Um, you know, most places are going to put their best foot forward, and, you know, nobody's, we have institutional isomorphism when it comes to things like service, diversity, leadership, inclusion, equity, right? We know that. There's no institution anywhere uh, in the country that is going to say, oh, we don't believe in those things, <laughs> right? Then the other thing is, uh, particularly when you're thinking about uh, individuals that look like you. How, ma how many students that look like me or have my background or have my research interests have you had in that program? Were they, uh, did they finish, right? Did, how long did it take them to finish? You know, so you, you've, you've got to do your due diligence, um, but in the end it's worth it to make a more informed decision uh, than to simply go by a, a prestige indicator or something silly like U.S. News and World Report rankings. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Pat Dye. Hi, Pat. Dance educator from the Board of Ed. Mm -hmm. um, first cohort for the EDD Dance Education Program here mm -hmm. at Teachers College. I'm taking a course which is very interesting. This professor, um, took it last night, mm -hmm. decided he's going to explain to me about hip-hop. Mm -hmm. and the history of hip-hop mm. and the youth and their experiences 
and where it sets in the world. And I told him, no, you're not. Um, I need not to do that too often because that is my error. That is my expertise. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned to him that I really need him to be open and need him to understand that I'm going to be a little aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the only one in my class of my um, background. Mm -hmm. I am Caribbean, so I'm still learning about the African-American aesthetic. Mm -hmm. But I was here when hip-hop started, mm -hmm. um, out of Brooklyn, out of the Bronx. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is that majority of the time, when I'm here to learn about research dealing with the arts, specifically dance and dance education, I still teach in the Board of Ed, and the kids all look like me. I'm trying to teach them to be leaders and understand that they are, they can do anything they want to. They just have to learn who they are. Coming to Teachers College gives me a great deal of satisfaction to know that I'm learning to research and put more information for myself, my students, my peers, and my community. But the majority of the time I've been here so far is talking about the European aspect, which doesn't connect to me at all. Um, which is not what I'm dealing with every day. Mm -hmm. Then I have to deal with misinformation or not complete information because everybody's writing books about us mm -hmm. but don't know us. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really, yeah, and I'm a boxer's daughter, so I'm not going to ever give up, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You could tell my voice will carry. Mm -hmm. You can feel my energy. But I need to know that I need the diversity of educators to teach us. And I understand that everybody needs a job, but they need to back up a little bit from our particular history and give us a moment to research and be part of the research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. There, there's really not a lot more I could say other than uh, <laughs> a, 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 amen to that. Um, one, one, thing, one, thing, one thing that I, that I will say, um, context uh, that, that have been homogeneous for a long time, you know, is, is, is sort of like a fish in water, right? You, 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 you've been immersed in it so long that you don't, you don't see it, right? And so, you know, and I, I'm, I'm not going to point a finger, but when, when something comes along and, and disrupts or, or kind of shifts the perspective on, on what's legitimate and real and accurate, um, a community of scholars, right? Not a community of ideologues, but a community of scholars should be able and willing and desirous of wrestling with that, right? You know, the, the, the way that we um, know that something is true uh, is when it withstands critique or criticism, right? And so uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a long, long history of um, artistic contributions and cultural contributions um, for people of African descent in American universities and cultural institutions, um, basically being run by, by folks uh, that are, are not part of the community. So it's, it's not new. Um, so what, what I would say to you is uh, to continue to be vocal, um, to be, uh, as long as you're being respected, try uh, also to be respectful, um, and, and, and offer you know, offer your critiques in, in, in the ways that are appropriate. One of the things I think most of us don't realize is we, we have more power sometimes than we realize, right? Now, I'm not saying all of the work of change and diversifying doctoral education and making everything, it, it shouldn't fall to the students. But, right, you know, sometimes you have to be the change that you want to see in the world. So I like what you said. You said... I'm not going to quit, right? It's my community. I have something to contribute. There's something that I want to learn, and I'm not going anywhere. Absolutely right. Um, and so, you know, and, and you, have, you have some leaders here, 
I'm looking at a couple of people here and a guy over there who, um, right there, you know, these, you, you got, you've, got, you've got some folks who, um, who will be allies and advocates for you in, in, uh, in some of that work. So uh, keep doing what you're doing. Oh, and by the way, uh, uh, the Tisch lecturer that is coming here next month is writing a book, an intellectual history of hip hop. Um, so if you can make it out uh, to, to the student time that folks are uh, preparing for him to have, um, I, I, think you'll, uh, I think you'll like him. Right. right. Oh, it's not the same. Gotcha. It's not mentioned. Right. I understand. I understand. Um, I feel your I feel your frustration. Anybody else? Oh, I was, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Thessani Maziz, and I'm a first year PhD student at the Science Ed program. Mm -hmm. um, so, talking about a community of scholars, um, how can collaborative spaces be productive and supportive and not competitive? Because a lot of times people are not willing to share, you know, what they went through and how to support other students. Um, yeah. And like my father, for example. Um, he got his PhD in Soviet Union, and he was one of the few Bangladeshi people there. So everyone was very unsupportive of him. So he had to develop this competitive nature. But mm -hmm. I'm in a different context, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, mm -hmm. how to collaborate and mm -hmm. also figure out, you know, who's the support network. So mm -hmm. what could be put in place so we can be more supportive of each other? Right. Well, the, the first place to start is uh, finding out who, are, who some of your peers are. Uh, that are interested in having that kind of uh, collaboration and, uh, and mutual support of one another. So start there. And it, it, does, it, doesn't, have to, it doesn't have to be a huge thing. What, one of the things that, that happens, so I talked a lot about social connection and, and building community. One, one of the ways um, that that happens is with, with just a few people to start, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mentioned writing groups just as an example. It's, it's not a panacea for anything. Um, but I've seen a couple of people, you know, meet in coffee shops, two or three people, and, and people say, oh, what, you guys writing together? And then o over time, it's like, can, can I join that group? And eventually it, uh, it, it can build out. When I was in the graduate school at, at Michigan, we had enough students um, who were expressing an interest in just having spaces, there were some really nice spaces in, uh, in the Rackham building at, at the University of Michigan. And so we were able to block off every other Friday about a three hour period and provide coffee and pastries and what have you. And no other students, unless they were part of the writing group, could use those spaces for the time that was, uh, that was blocked off. And eventually that, that was that was a way to, to just be supportive, not trying to impose how they would do things necessarily. Um, so, you know, think, think small. You know, what, what, what would it look like for you, you know, as a first year student to just kind of get your sea legs in terms of, you know, finding a sense of community while also being able to be productive. Um, so that's, that's one. Then the other, and I'll keep saying this, this is a well-endowed institution. Um, <laughs> once you have some ideas, you can always run things uh, up, up the chain of command and, and see if your president and your vice president and your provost and your vice provost for students, mm -hmm. if, these, if these folks uh, can support some of the things that you come up with. Uh, and in some cases, um, sometimes the wheel has already been invent it, and sometimes we just don't know about it. Um, so I, I, I would start there. There's, there's, there's nothing really profound, you know, that, that I want to offer. But I do, I took out the one slide that some of the questions you guys are asking me I should have kept in there. And it was about structure and agency. And I was really going to emphasize that you have more agency sometimes uh, than you know. And so if you exercise some of that, uh, with proper decorum uh, and not get ahead of yourself, um, you, you, you can probably get support for some of the things you're thinking. I, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, 
Um, thank you very much um, for the information. My name is Rakim Amalo Jenkins. My mentor is Dr. Lewis McCoy. Okay. Tell me to come here. Oh, yeah. Um, That's my guy. Uh, I've, um, I was a Mellon Mays Fellow um, at the City College of New York. Mm -hmm. um, I decided to go into teaching. Okay. So I've been teaching for the last five and a half years yeah. um, in Brownsville in the South Bronx. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to transition because I wanted to get a PhD once I came into undergrad. Mm -hmm. And I want to transition from my career. Mm -hmm back into a PhD program. Mm -hmm. um, my undergrad, I studied like Pan-Africanism, looking at mm -hmm. Kwame Nkrumah, mm -hmm. W. Du Bois, and black yep. intellectual thought. Yes, sir, yes, sir. However, like when I'm now teaching, I have some like in the classroom experience, um, looking at systems and structures and um, just like charter schools and discipline, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> You know, the voice asserts, how does it feel to be a problem Absolutely. and just looking at this thing? Yep. Yep. Um, so I have like two questions. One, what is advice you would give me or my peers who's looking to move from a career that they had for the last five years into um, still working a full time job into a PhD program? Mm -hmm. One. Mm -hmm. And two, how do you um, choose a discipline? <laughs> When, when you're looking at it, because I can see I can do sociology, mm -hmm. urban education, mm -hmm. African-American mm -hmm. studies, mm -hmm. I can go into mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. So how do you reconcile those differences mm -hmm. um, being five years out of undergrad, yep. um, have a master's in education, yep. but wanting to go into yep. like these certain yep. disciplines? Yeah. Well, this, this, this is what I'm going to do since you're a, a mentee of a real dear friend of mine. Um, why don't you and I go out and have coffee and I'll be able to answer some of those questions in, uh, in, in much greater detail than I could, uh, than I could do here. Um, what's your second question? Um, no, those are the two okay. questions. All right, yep. wait, wait. The, so the first the one. Fir the first the one, career change. Uh, right, the career change. Okay, so, so that, you know, there, there are a lot of factors that, that go into that career change, but um, education in particular, not saying that other fields are, are not amenable to it, but it's not so far out of the norm for somebody who's been a classroom teacher uh, for you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years in some cases to decide that uh, they, want, they want to really put the practice and the uh, praxis that they've had together with deeper intellectual uh, work and, and research. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the reasons I thought somebody was gonna say about why that time to degree in education was so much higher is because many of those students are, are part-time students. And so, um, so there are a number of education doctoral programs that uh, are, are already primed uh, for, uh, for someone like you. Now, that's not to say that there aren't others, um, but it's, it's not as unusual or outside the norm a, a, as you might think. Uh, and in fact, some of, some of the great names uh, in educational research um, were individuals who spent their careers in initially teaching in schools or in community organizations. So we, we, you're, you're doomies, man. You. you and I can, we, we can have lunch and coffee and, and, we, and we can chop it up. I appreciate it. Yep, Thank you. sure thing. Yes. Um, good afternoon, evening. Yep. Um, yep. <laughs> I'm Patricia and Hi, Patricia. I am a board member of the Coalition of Latinx Scholars. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I have a question for sure. you um, yeah. that I've been trying to struggle with for the last two years. I'm doing my yeah. master's here. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I've spoken to a lot of students, especially students of low income mm -hmm. and backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And um, I've had a, a good friend drop out of his program mm -hmm. um, because he couldn't afford it. Yeah. And uh, um, sorry, thank it's you. It's okay, it's okay, it's all right. Take your time. Sorry. And so, um, I feel um, that it's my responsibility um, to advocate for it. Yep. Sorry. I get it. Been there. Been there, it's okay. It's embarrassing to cry, you know? It's like shameful and our culture. No shame in it. <laughs> Zero. Um, so I've been trying to figure out how to support. There we go. How to get their voices heard. And um, 
It's okay, Patricia. While she's gathering herself, a lot of us go into this work for just the reason she said, which is we want to be advocates. We want to be educators. We want to empower other people. And, and when you have that kind of commitment, and then you have to deal with these other things that are really challenging, that's, that's, that's a double whammy. So none, none of what you're expressing surprises me. I, I get it. I absolutely get it. Um, I, I, be, I became an academic. I, I love research, but I wanted to change the world. So I get it. <laughs> I understand it. I understand. Kind yeah. of research, too. I'm trying to tackle three data projects this yeah. semester. And yeah. I'm yeah. also very frustrated because I tried last semester and it didn't work. I, I tried to get students together and and because we're from low income backgrounds we're trying to work we're trying to pay um our tuitions and we don't know if we should help the university like hear our voices and n figure out how to pay but i i just want guidance who do i go to who do i talk to we've tried these past few years the other coalition um members um our predecessors have told us that they've talked to the leadership but we don't know um well, you got some new leadership, um, so I'm going to do what I usually do. Talk to your provost. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm all, I'm, I've been putting my wife on the spot a lot, um, but... But she's overworked, but, too, but, you Well, know? That, that, that is true. That, that is true. Um, so... I, 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 have, I have a little more time on my hands than she does, so I'd, I, I'd be glad to, uh, to have coffee and, uh, and, and talk with you too and, and to, to help you brainstorm. Um, th this kind of stuff has always been a labor of love for me, and, and I get it. I've been there. Um, and you can do it. You can do it. It's going to be okay. Um, so please, get my email. Send me, uh, send me an email. Okay. And, uh, and we'll have a chat, and I'll, I'll try to help you think about what you can do. Is that okay? Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So, one more, please. Okay. So, her, um, her statement, more than a question, is something that I wanted to ask the university, not necessarily you. I am one of those students that, you saw that line that showed how long it has taken someone to get their degree. Mm -hmm. That's me. Mm -hmm. Master's degree, two years, a year and a half here. Mm -hmm. Tuition was $349, $340 a credit in 1989. Mm -hmm. When I attended mm -hmm. for my master's. Mm -hmm. MED in two years, 91 to 93. Mm -hmm. Took time off because I was a teacher full time mm -hmm. while I was pursuing all of my degrees here. Mm -hmm. Took time off, had a family, came back, and have been trying to pursue the EDD, mm -hmm. not the PhD. If I could do it over again, I would do it differently. Mm -hmm. um, what supports does the college have in place for people like me who work full time, who have families who work in settings where the traditional structure of classes primarily during the academic year take place and there's not enough in the summer. People like me who, now the diversity of this place has changed in 30 years. I have to tell you, it is a blessing because leaving and coming back because I, was, I have been ABD and I have left in frustration of the lack of diversity, because of the lack of support. But coming back and seeing the change in leadership and seeing some supports in place, Dr. Mensa, you know, I saw, so you, you know, Dr. So you, you know. So we have people here, but we still don't have enough supports for students like me who are ABD. So those administrators that are in the building, this initiative, that you have for doctoral students, I'm glad that you've um, expanded it beyond just males. Mm -hmm. And I try to run over that $16 bridge to come over when you have programs. 
but what can you put into place to help people like me not be in that 50% who are ABD? <laughs> so, I, first of all, I want to say thank you so much, Larry, because, because, um, thank you, thank you, because, I mean, not only did I, you know, what you what you had to say, I thought was really useful. I mean, I thought I had something I had to go to earlier, and I couldn't leave because yeah. you. Thank so, you, but also the questions that that you know, elicited, and and the, and I thank yeah. everybody for the things that you've said. You know, we hear you. Uh, you know, I think we're trying the best we can to, you know, you know, Tom is working on this, Stephanie, to, to try to structure our, you know, student experience so that everybody gets the support and the mentoring that they need. You know, I think we understand that. You know, it's a big place and there's a lot of work to do. And I think this, you know, this is really, that is really one of the kind of priorities that we have for doing that. So I think, you know, we're working on that. I mean, the sort of physical, uh, you know, view of that is that we're trying to, you know, centralize our uh, student services in the first floor of Thorndike. We're working on that. You know, we used to have a career office that was in the basement. We didn't think that was a very good message. We've moved that up to the front. So those that were just starting. And so, I mean, the idea of the idea of you know, students having the support, getting the mentoring, organizing the kind of student, I mean, I know I was a professor here and, and you, know, you, said it was, you said it was useful to go to students and then you said the internet didn't help. I thought you were gonna say, going to the professors isn't always that helpful either. I thank you for not saying that. And I, you know, I, this, you know, the students, our student groups in economics, you know, they, knew, they knew much better about how people respond to other professors and other things like that. So we're trying to do that, and I agree with Larry to kind of do that. I mean, our student group in economics was organized by students. And that, you know, then as that got stronger, I used it all the time when students came to me. So that's one thing. Money, we're totally aware of that. Uh, you know, we're doing what we can to try to, you know, provide better financial support to students and financial aid, and also to try to keep the you know, we raise tuition all the time. One of our goals is to try to at least to slow down the increase in tuition. So totally understand that. I know it's, we, we, we know the debt that so many people have. You know, that breaks our heart. We understand that. We, you know, this isn't business school. You're not going to be corporate lawyers. You know, so paying off $50,000 of debt is very difficult. So I just, I, I, you know, we're working on that. We understand, we hear what people are saying. And so I think that that's, you know, that's what I can say, you know, to this thing. We're certainly trying as best as we can, and I think we've had some success to diversify our faculty. You know, that's a definite priority for that. I mean, that's something that we talk about all the time. So anyway, I, you know, I don't, you know, I, I, we can't answer these questions. It's really hard for me to hear that and not be able to really respond, but I think we're trying to do what we can and, you know, keep, coming to us asking, you know, you know, keep being strong and saying, you know, complaining and saying what you need. And I think we'll try to respond. So again, thank you really, Larry, thank you so much. So that's a good segue to um, sort of bring this to a close. I wanna first and foremost, thank you guys for being here. Um, I'm going to piggyback a little bit on something that Dr. Rowley said on the conversation on his presentation about absence of community, and that's something that we don't want anyone here to walk away from, feeling like there's no community, and we work really, really hard at creating that, but we can't do that work without you. So first and foremost, thank you for being here because these programs are not possible without you. Um, second, um, there is a reception, um, so as you head out. Um, you can have conversations with Dr. Rowley one-on-one. -on -one. You can speak to us, give us your ideas, because that's how we keep these programs going. The reception is in 109 San Cal. And then lastly, a little bit of um, TC, um, well, Office of the Vice President for Diversity and Community Affairs Tradition. Um, Dr. Rowley, we have a little memento for you so that you can bring it back to your office, bring it back to your space, and um, you can enjoy it.
And, and then, of course, last but not least, we just want to thank everyone that makes these programs possible. Again, everything is a community effort, so thank you, Karen, for all the work that you do. Um, your leadership, Janice, Melissa, um, facilities, media services, you for being ever here. Let's continue to um, have a collaborative year, and um, please keep your eye out, and don't delete my emails when I send them out, because that's what these <laughs> programs are about. Thank you. <laughs>